So now, uh, as we are just on time, it is six. So we, we, are, we are going to start with our next speaker, Professor Dr. Tom Ward. Uh, welcome, the Professor Dr. Tom Ward. So let's... Uh, so Professor Dr. Tom Ward is a Deputy Vice Chancellor, Leeds University, United Kingdom, and he's been presenting on improving higher education during a pandemic. And this session would be chaired by Dr. A.K. Ramul Hawk, Professor, Department of Economics, East West University, Bangladesh. So I'm requesting Dr. A.K. Ramul Hawk to conduct this session. So. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. This is uh... This last session was very illuminating, told, uh, taught us quite an interesting thing on sustainable issues and how education can be molded. Uh, this is uh, the session by uh, Tom Ward, and Tom Ward is from University of Leeds. I believe that uh, my, I was looking at his background, he's a mathematician, professor of mathematics, and then went to the university administration. Uh, uh, let me welcome Professor uh, Ward to present his, uh, his, uh, his uh, Paper and this will take about uh, the session is about 50 minutes. So uh, let's see how Professor Word will present and then we'll go. We'll have time for question and answer. So, Professor Word. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers. Uh, I will endeavor to share my screen. Um, please let me know if, uh, if, if that is not working. No problem. So while I wait for the uh, screen to upload, uh, let me just say, uh, thank you to the organizers and I hope I hope uh, a screen is visible now. Yes. Yes, Professor. Great. Thank you. So thank you. And uh, I'm really delighted to follow um, Dr. Holland, who, who said such uh, important things that I will uh, come back to um, at, at the end of my brief presentation. <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry not to be with you in person, but uh, uh, it's great to be here. I'm going to talk about some quite practical things, uh, some quite instrumental things. Uh, what happened in 2020 for higher education, uh, how we responded to it, some of the lessons we learned, and how it has slightly changed how we look to the future. Uh, and then I will try and say a little bit about the difficult territory of um, measurement in education. Uh, when we talk about outcome-based education, implicitly we are talking also about measuring things. And measuring things in education is incredibly difficult. And I want to say a little bit about that and possibly there will be some discussion about that. So first of all, um, what was our experience in 2020? The University of Leeds is a campus university, a very beautiful campus, a mixture of um, historic buildings and modern cutting edge facilities, a busy place and a very welcoming place. And the experience of working here or being a student here is very linked to the campus. Uh, it's very much about what is enabled by these buildings. What can we achieve together in these buildings and using these physical spaces? Just to give you a sense of scale, we have around 40,000 students and we have seven or 8,000 staff. The campus is a small town, really. It's friendly, very busy. At times it's crowded. Uh, so it's a, you can think of it as a town devoted to education and research. Now, we all know what happened in 2020. Around the middle of March, at quite short notice, we had to move off campus and switch to teaching online. We had to say goodbye to historic buildings. The one 
on the top left is often used for public outreach. So the whole city lost access to this building. We had to say goodbye to libraries. This picture is an undergraduate library, very much loved by our students. We had to say goodbye to the spaces and open areas on campus where people would meet and enjoy art on campus and social events on campus. We had to say goodbye to a very famous reading room in an old classical library, the beautiful sight lines of campus, the Students' Union, a huge center of social, of volunteering, of cultural activity for our students. Our students and staff had to say goodbye to um, getting together physically, to the shared uh, joy and excitement of what is possible when we're together doing education. Our students particularly were very upset at the realization that they would not be able to celebrate a graduation with family and friends in the normal way. We had to say goodbye at short notice to some facilities. This is a sports center and swimming pool. There are many facilities like this that we just had to abandon in the short term. Leaving the campus felt like a bereavement. And one of the things we learned to deal with was that sense of loss, that students felt bereaved of, of, of things that they um, had great affection for. And there are some lessons around that that we are still thinking about. And of course, this, this migration to online education um, landed very differently or meant different things to different people. So if I can start with myself, I moved from an office a very large, comfortable office, very well served uh, in a magnificent building to a comfortable, convenient desk at home. And I've spent the last six months at that desk, uh, pretty much constantly in Teams meetings. And in some ways, this was quite painless for me. The biggest danger I faced probably was the fact that I had access to a kitchen downstairs whenever I wanted it and could eat as much as I liked. And um, in all practical ways, my life really became simpler. It became easier to organize meetings. It became simpler to connect with people. My day became shorter because I wasn't walking to work anymore. So that was a, a, an impact on me personally. It wasn't, it wasn't simple because another lesson we learned is that back-to-back -back Teams meetings or video conferencing is exhausting. It is a huge strain to be online constantly. And decision-making is exhausting. And one of the things that happened to people in my kind of role at universities all over the world was we needed to very rapidly make some quite big decisions in an environment of great uncertainty. And another lesson we learned is that decision-making is tiring and we mediate that normally by standing around after a meeting where we've made some big decisions and drinking coffee and sharing the feeling of the burden of the decision and looking after each other a bit. And I don't think we've been good at that in the online world. We miss the, what the Americans call the water cooler moments where we just interact as humans over a cup of tea or coffee and share the burden of what we are doing and what we're deciding. But that was my story. For many of our staff, life was much harder Many of them had school-aged children at home with complex responsibilities for care and education. Some staff live in rural locations with very poor internet. 
Some had inadequate IT at home, and we had to quickly mobilize some technical support for them. Some of them were literally having to learn to teach and attend meetings and so on with a laptop sat on their lap at the edge of a bed because everyone else in their household was also at home working from home. And the children were using the kitchen table to do their homework. So it was physically quite challenging for people. And I think the effort made there was huge and the consequences in terms of tiredness and impact on staff well-being is very big. Most important of all for students, uh, the experience was very variable. Some international students could not get home because of visa conditions or COVID lockdowns. And if you imagine being the parent of a young person the other side of the world at a time of pandemic, uh, the anxiety levels were very high and it was very difficult for our students and for their parents. Many of our home students come from home environments that are quite challenging. Some of them, of course, went home to a place with a quiet room and a nice desk and good broadband and IT, and in fact, were looked after extremely well in great comfort. Some of them returned to households with no internet. Many of them returned to households with no adequate workspace. Many of them returned to households with no adequate IT equipment. And part of our response involved the mobilization of an enormous amount of support for uh, students in that situation. All the students suddenly found themselves grappling with um, uncertainty and anxiety about the future. Uh, at the end of February, they all had a very clear understanding of how they would be assessed, what they needed to do to get through their examinations and complete coursework and projects, how they would be classified for their final degree award. They had great confidence in what was going to happen next. By the end of March, they had enormous anxiety about how they were going to be assessed, enormous uncertainty about what would determine their degree classification. So right from the start, we were dealing with huge volumes of inquiries, understandable inquiries from anxious students and parents, wanting to understand exactly what was going to happen next in an environment where we didn't know what was going to happen next. So we had to make early big decisions about how we would assess students. And another of the lessons that we learned was that, um, and this is not the only situation where this is true, sometimes an early decision communicated well is more useful than the right decision. When people are so uncertain about the future, they need confidence and a confident assertion of a less than perfect solution is much better than delay when people are frightened. We also had to confront the fact that students, as well as being anxious, were lonely. Um, it's difficult at the best of times to be um, suddenly taken away from your social circle. But for young people, this was quite devastating. And we saw a real increase in the need for what you might call emotional or mental health support for students. And dealing with that proved to be quite tricky. Uh, but again, the, um, the way staff responded was very impressive. With the benefit of the experience of 2020, it's possible to start to think about some of the very big picture lessons that we've been learning. One of them, 
thank goodness, is that roughly speaking, the technology we relied on for online education worked. There were some dramatic moments. There was uh, over the course of one weekend early on, we were in touch with Microsoft for Europe and dealing with them about capacity in the main Teams platform we were using. And during the course of the weekend, uh, they doubled and doubled and doubled and doubled again. The bandwidth, in a sense, of the provision they were making for our university. And one of the lessons we drew from that is that um, when things get uh, very difficult or when you suddenly escalate the demand you're making, it is very reassuring to be dealing with the very biggest companies. So what happened, I, didn't, I, don't, I don't know the exact details, but hundreds of people were mobilized within Microsoft over the course of that weekend in order to boost capacity. And I think um, we learned that some of the things we grumbled about, um, which include cost, for example, suddenly uh, it was very comforting to have a huge global corporation trying to help us uh, at a time of, of real difficulty. Our own IT services had an enormous job to do. We had to move equipment off site. Uh, we had to provide equipment to people scattered in houses. We had to reconfigure a great deal of our IT infrastructure at short notice. And so some of my colleagues in IT were more or less working 24 hours a day until we got things underway. A particular difficulty for us, and I mean us in the broadest sense, for universities, I fear globally, is that universities are often targets of cyber attack. And in the few months before COVID hit, several universities in Europe experienced uh, massive successful cyber attacks. A university in the Netherlands ended up paying a ransom. Pardon me, a university in the UK ended up having to let, delay the start of teaching because of cyber attacks. And there was a real tension. The first thing you want to do when you're moving online off campus is to make it easier to get onto our network, to make it easier to tunnel through our security. But at the same time, we had to ensure that we were protected against cyber attack. I think one of the big lessons for the future is that we need to become much smarter about how we balance openness and security in our IT infrastructure, because all universities are becoming more open as they go more online, but more vulnerable to quite sinister cyber attacks. And that's quite a difficult balance to get right. <laughs> Our staff generally responded really well to the challenge of moving online at high speed. Fortunately, Leeds University embraced digital technology for learning a long time ago. And for many of our staff, they already had some expertise in the platforms we were using. Some of our colleagues had resisted using digital technology and they found it more difficult, but they adopted fairly well. Our students, as I've mentioned, had quite diverse experiences. They generally cope well with new, new ways of learning and assessment. Their main concerns were about digital poverty. Students who were less able to access learning online. They had, as I've mentioned, huge anxiety about how they would be assessed and how their marks would be generated and how their degree classification would be determined, but we got through that. 
the contrast though between the best and the worst um, enabled students was enormous. We had stories of students trying to access complex uh, virtual learning environments and complex interactive learning events on a mobile phone. And you, you will be familiar with the difficulties that that presents. The sense of community and the opportunity for shared experiences and shared support is the thing that suffered most, of course. And I'll try and illustrate some of the phenomena that happened for us with some examples. Each year, our final year students in fine art put on an impressive show as a group with opportunities for their families to see some of the work they've done, sometimes for people from industry, from design industries to see some of the work they've done. Those students contacted me because they were feeling grief and loss. They accepted they were going to be assessed in a different way and they were comfortable with that. But the fact they were going to lose that show, that event, that opportunity to show something to their families and to share the experience of putting on a show about the art they had created uh, was very difficult for them. And they felt a form of loss and of bereavement. They, they were incredibly sad about what they were going to miss at that unique moment. You only, you only graduate once in your life and you only have the experience of being with your fellow students, successfully completing your studies once in your life. And they suddenly were not able to be together to do that. We had, among the difficult decisions we took was we decided to commit absolutely to graduating our students on schedule. They were expecting to graduate on a specific day, and we were determined that they would graduate on the day they expected. It would be a virtual event, but they would become graduates when they expected. That meant, for example, that we couldn't wait to see if things improved with the pandemic in order to hold events. We had to proceed on the normal schedule. And that, I think was the right decision, but it was um, a difficult one. I've, I've already mentioned communications. I think the hardest thing for most of the people in education leadership at the university was making those decisions and communicating them to students quickly and in a way that they could understand uh, fully. We also had some uh, direct interaction with the pandemic in a different sense. University of Leeds is a very big player in the life sciences and health. In a typical year, 1500 new graduates leave the university and enter our national health service, doctors, midwives, nurses, and so on the strain that the National Health Service was under meant that we were asked to try and speed up that process. And we did manage to get our medical students and our nursing students graduated quicker than normal and into the health service and working quicker than normal. That was an enormous effort and um, was only possible because of real commitment from the students and the staff and the local hospitals. We also, interestingly, were able to contribute to the research projects connected with COVID. We lent some of our equipment to do high speed um, testing. We uh, lent some of our people who are experts in that sort of uh, biochemistry and medicine. And it was, um, I think it, it was helpful for the organization to feel like we had something to contribute to, uh, 
to a problem the country was facing. So uh, this strange image uh, is from our Institute for Data Analytics. And I chose it because I think the future is different and complex. And I want to say a little bit about how educational futures are starting to look like for us. The first thing I would say is that the story I've just told you of how we responded to the pandemic and how we moved online was a tactical reaction to an emergency. It was not a planned approach. It was not strategic. It was not well evidenced. And very early on, in March, April, we realized that for the next academic year and possibly for a longer term future, we needed to think differently about education. Putting material that you prepared and designed for face-to-face -face learning online uh, is not online education. It is a poor cousin of online education. It's the right thing to do in an emergency. If you cannot get into the lecture theater, of course, you should make your material available to the students. But it's not online education and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't deliver high quality. So we needed to start thinking about how do you design a curriculum? How do you design assessment for a hybrid model of education? which can be delivered online if it needs to be, that uses face-to-face -face opportunities when they become available. That unsurprisingly turns out to be difficult and new and unfamiliar and quite a challenge for staff. We all have our comfort zone of how we teach and that's primarily comes from how we always taught and to some extent comes from how we were taught and learning new things is difficult inside that um the only thing that was that is easy is the content the content the factual content of the curriculum is not difficult to deliver in the room outside the room online down a telephone line but that's a tiny part of what higher education is. The interactions, the experience, the community, the feeling as a student that I am learning the craft and joining a community of practice in my subject area, those are difficult. And uh, a lot of our focus over the year has been in trying to find ways to do that in this online or hybrid environment. Ironically, some things um, became very successful. So, so one of the interesting reflections from 2020 is that we do, um, historically, a university like Leeds does a lot of formal examinations. Large numbers of students sat in rows, writing, handwriting in paper books, uh, for a timed examination. It's always felt odd. Uh, for many of our students, they would say, this is the only time we write with our hands. The rest of their studies, their project work and so on, they're not handwriting. Their work environment will not involve handwriting, but their formal examinations do. Equally, pedagogical experts tell us that formal examinations measure something, but they don't really measure learning or deep learning very effectively. They measure a certain set of attributes, primarily how good you are at doing formal examinations. We were forced to radically redesign our assessments. And ironically, many of the assessments became much better, much more effective, much closer 
to what our students will be doing in the workplace. I bet everyone in this conference has experiences at work of saying, I need to write a report about this, something. I have several days in which to do it. I can access any resources I like. And at the end of that process, I need to present my report to some group of people and persuade them. That's what a work piece of homework is like. That's what a workplace assessment is like. And we found ourselves forced by the pandemic to make some of our assessments look like that. So ironically, in 2020, it's possible for the first time our students were doing assessments that will be useful as an assessment of how good they are at what they are going to do as graduates. Unpacking that lesson is a long and complicated story, but is part of what we're going to be doing over the next few years. Planning for all this required enormous amounts of support for digital learning. We were very fortunate in that we already had a well-established digital education service with training packages and a lot of expertise. Most of the training needed was already available. We just needed to give staff time to access it. We had 18 digital platforms or pieces of software, if you like, to support learning. And through the analysis of what we needed to do, we added another seven big platforms that needed to be implemented before the new academic year could start. This was not easy. And we placed enormous strain on our IT capacity, but they managed. But a key bottleneck or, or uh, controller of speed of what we could do proved to be IT capacity. And this was not about money. This was about people. Um, because all universities in the country were doing fairly similar things, the people available with the expertise needed were in short supply nationally. And that was quite a challenging lesson. We also had some very complex uh, issues thrown up by laboratories, design studios, specialist spaces, where COVID safety reduced the capacity. So we had to find ingenious online ways to take some of the pressure off our laboratory spaces and do virtual laboratories. And that's still evolving. The future is unfolding. We are now teaching in this online way. Um, staff and students are far more confident about using online technology. The expertise in using digital technology to support learning has grown enormously. And as we become more confident, new opportunities for new ideas in education are growing. Innovative ways to learn across borders are expanding. It's becoming commonplace that we attend seminars in other countries without getting on an aeroplane. It's not clear what universities will look like in the future, but there are grounds for optimism. There are grounds for imagining a future where it's common for students in a seminar to be interacting with students in other countries uh, it's common, it's going to become commonplace to, to learn from each other. One of the very interesting, um, sometimes angry discussions in the UK is about decolonizing the curriculum, about addressing historic uh, narrow visions of how we teach our own history. Well, you can start to imagine a future in which that conversation looks very different. Because instead of uh, having that discussion inside a university inside one country, we raise those questions in seminar groups with students from other countries who say it's very interesting to hear your perception of colonial history, but I'm in a country that was colonized and my perception is this. 
and we learn from each other in new ways because we've got used to the idea of just talking to each other in different countries using digital technology. The scope is enormous. We will, however, be dealing with issues like digital poverty and the fact that what has happened in schools, high schools in the UK this year, has widened the gap between more advantaged students and less advantaged students. We're going to be dealing with that for many, many years to come. It's a huge impact and, and very problematic, and it's a global impact. Some of the responses to the pandemic have widened inequalities in access to education. And part of our project, our shared project, is to address that. And finally, I want to say a word about measurement. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the biggest danger I face is that I have a kitchen downstairs that I can access all day. And some things are easy to measure. Sometimes uh, governments particularly think that higher education should be as easy to measure as my weight. We just step on some sort of education scale and measure a number and say well done or badly done. Understandably, students, governments, taxpayers, funders say that we put effort and resource and money into universities and it's reasonable to ask for a measurement of what we get back. That's fair enough. We should be totally happy about that. But measurements can be problematical. And I'll illustrate that with two examples. Some policymakers and governments want to reach out for simple numbers. So recently, uh, our own Minister for Higher Education said that she did not want to see any change in the number of contact hours in the move to online education. But one of the things we've learned about online education is that a one hour long didactic lecture delivered online doesn't work effectively. Online, you need shorter interactions and more interactive uh, opportunities for learning. And so we, we are pushing back saying, please don't pressure us to do the thing that we know is not the best thing pedagogically for our students. The minister wants us to do this because she wants a measurement. She wants to be able to say to government, to parliament, the number of hours of lectures has not diminished. And what we want to say is we're trying to do education differently and you're measuring the wrong thing. That's a difficult conversation. Another example, for very understandable reasons, our government and the treasury is very interested in using future earnings of graduates, salaries of graduates to assess whether a university is doing an effective job. But this is hugely problematic. One of the things we know about earnings of graduates is that it's very influenced by gender. It's very influenced by region of country. It's very influenced by subject mix. It's not connected to the societal goods that Dr. Holland was talking about earlier. It's not connected to the sustainability agenda. It's not connected to gender equality. And it's nothing to do with teaching. So measuring future salaries of graduates creates another huge problem. Who would like to live in a society where every university tries to only generate graduates who will go into banking? We need graduates who go into lots of different things and some of them will earn less and we need to be comfortable with that. The reality, as we all know, is that measuring higher education, measuring education is not a single number. It is a massively complex picture. And the starting point for measuring education should start with acknowledging that complexity. Outcome-based education, which places the student and 
their capabilities and what they can do at the center is much better than naive use of metrics. But it's very important that those outcomes are rounded, not just skills and knowledge, but what your graduates are like as citizens. How engaged are your graduates with environmental concerns, with gender rights, and so on? The most important outcomes we might want to assess come from the development goals that Dr. Howland was talking about. Of course, we want graduates to know their subject. I want to fly in airplanes designed by engineers who really, really know their stuff. But the 21st century will either see widespread environmental collapse, enormous damage to human well being, and enormous loss of life, or it will see a dramatic shift in how we understand and interact with the natural world. The economic model of the 20th century is not going to be one that works for the 21st century. And the outcome we should aspire to measure for universities is how do our graduates contribute to a radical change in thinking that will produce a sustainable world where everyone in it can flourish and we can survive the climate and environmental impact that is the legacy we've inherited. So thank you for your attention. Thank you again for organizing this fantastic um, event. I hope I've stuck to time and have left some space for questions or comments, which I would welcome very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Ward. I think uh, you finished in 40 minutes, so we have some time, extra time, actually. I have already seen some questions coming from the uh, from the audience and um, I'm going to read out, but uh, thank you very much for uh, telling us how you have uh, coped with the challenges of the COVID. I still enormous challenge for all of us. So the first question that I would, uh, is, is a question uh, about uh, arranging theory examination. Uh, is possible, they're thinking this is possible. How do you arrange practical examination at your country, in your university? Uh, is it at person? Uh, you, can you suggest any case for countries where devices are not available for the learners? So if you can give us some lights on that, that would be pretty good. Those are two very, very difficult questions. I think um, we, the way we approached uh, practical examinations was, first of all, to test very hard where they were absolutely needed. So I think, I mean, my lovely colleagues in, in some disciplines started by saying, we need lots of them. And then we said, really, really ask yourself very hard, what do you absolutely need to do to demonstrate learning outcomes? Mm -hmm. And the number shrank and shrank and shrank. There's a tiny bit of uh, practical examination and let's use practical in, in a, the biggest possible sense. For example, clinicians, dentists, you, you, cannot, you cannot assess and train clinicians and dentists entirely online. So what we did was we minimized the volume and then, and then maximized the capacity of uh, on-campus facilities in a way that was safe for COVID to allow those, those examinations to take place face-to-face. But the number turned out to be very, very small, much smaller than uh, we, start, we, we thought at first and much smaller than we've done in the past. I think, I think your, the second question was about uh, a global perspective on access to digital technology for learning. Yes. Um, this is huge. And all I would say is that I think our part of our evolution of understanding is that uh, a 20th century perspective would talk about education in development terms as um, building schools. And I think a 21st century perspective is going to be much more about building digital infrastructure. So if you look at uh, bodies like the Gates Foundation, they are focused on building internet capability um, 
across Africa and trying to develop a way to have um, access to information because it is, it is emerging with great clarity that it is internet connectivity and basic IT, it needs to be quite simple sort of Chromebooks and internet, uh, solar powered access to the internet means you can penetrate deep into rural communities uh, in poorer countries. We are a million miles away from done, but it's great that bodies as significant as the Gates Foundation are focused on that. But that will be the great, uh, the great barrier to access in, in the 21st century will be, am I connected? We, we are empowered when we're connected. So it remains a focus and I hope more and more development funding goes into that territory. Yes, uh, we have another related question, which is not about the exam, but about laboratory lab based courses, how you are teaching it. It's difficult. Um, and uh, so I think multiple strands of work happened here. One of them is there is more and more um, capability for online virtual laboratories. Um, some of them, uh, so a lot of my colleagues spent a lot of time over the summer uh, preparing uh, materials showing experiments where possible. But I think we all accept that there is nothing quite like having your own hands on the test tube and the Bunsen burner and the equipment and the NMR machine and so on. And again, what we focused on was simply acknowledging that the in-person face-to-face um, experiences in the laboratories and with the equipment had become a precious resource. It had become extremely valuable because there was less of it um, so you had to design your curriculum to use it like it was a very precious resource. And people are very smart. So I've been very impressed by how colleagues in science disciplines and clinical disciplines and design have found ways to do a huge amount uh, in virtual laboratories and then a tiny amount of high value adding uh, activity face to face and in a sense this is always what we've this is related to what many of us have sought in so-called flipped learning which was to say let's think of the time the the physical infrastructure of the seminar room or the lecture theater the cost of the person standing at the front the effort of the students who gathered let's acknowledge that's expensive in effort and cash. Let's use it where it adds most value, which is not a didactic lecture. You can deliver, you can deliver the lecture remotely. When you gather, what activity adds most value? And that principle is one of the big lessons of COVID is if it's hard to use face-to-face -face facilities, let's be sure we use them where they add most value which is questions and answers, interaction, team building, shared project activities, and so on, not lectures. And that's what we've tried to do, but I'm not pretending um, it's easy. Okay, thank you. That was very good. Uh, we have another question and that's uh, about digital divide. We know the digital divide that exists in the low income countries, but how, what about in UK? Um, uh, the um, it's it's very interesting the uh, the the perspectives of different countries from different places in the world, and of course the UK is is a relatively wealthy country, but um, but our Gini coefficient for those who know this language is not so impressive, and in fact, uh, the UK has a lot of entrenched multi-generational poverty. And, um, and it, it is complicated territory, but we all know the experience, the, 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 the lack of access and the experience is partly 
measured by absolute poverty, but is mainly measured by relative poverty. And being poor in a country like the UK or the US is very difficult because, because they're wealthy countries. So housing is very expensive and, um, all, and transport is very expensive. So it's, we have a large number of people who do not have the ability to access education in the way we would want. Um, and I, I think we're not yet doing a great job at dealing with that. And our experience was, if I tell you that over the summer, one of the strange things we did was place an order for 1500 laptops to distribute to students who didn't have laptops. And that's in a context where I have attended conferences like this, but predominantly with people from European or North American countries, where speakers will begin by saying, all our students have laptops. It's not true. And, and they'll begin by saying, all our students have smartphones. And that's not true either. And we just need to be honest about that confront the numbers realistically and provide support where it's needed. Okay, that's very good. Uh, we have uh, two, three more questions. Let me, let me, we have time about, uh, let's see, about seven minutes. So let me read all three and you can answer one by one or any yeah. way, uh, any way you like. Uh, one question is about uh, cyber harassment that because of the online education, sometimes how do you manage cyber bullying? That's the question. Uh, the second question is about uh, how many hours you have decreased from the contact hours because of online? Is there, you know, what is your plan on it? That's what you have talked about it from the, and the third one is uh, can, can the virtual lab uh, be replaced by face-to-face -face labs? So, you know, what, uh, I think the other way, phase two, phase three, by yes. Yeah. So yes. That's yeah. And those are three good questions. Uh, first of all, um, uh, cyber harassment and online uh, is, is a huge, huge issue. It was a huge issue already. Um, uh, and I think one of the, the, the online environment can be a toxic place particularly for women. And that's a huge problem. Uh, if I tell you that a few years, so one of our national newspapers, The Guardian, has a huge, well-developed site called Comment is Free, where people can contribute articles freely, anyone can write, anyone can comment, and it's a big debating chamber. And some, uh, some people did a research project to, to find out um, who contributing on that site was experiencing the most harassment, abusive messages. And it turned out the 10 most abused people on that site, eight were women and two men in the top 10 were black. And that is just an appalling thing to confront, that the online world has become an arena in which harassment and abuse of women and racial abuse has become commonplace. And I think that's the starting point. We cannot pretend that just because we have the privilege of working in higher education or the fact that our students are lovely protects us from that. It doesn't. So we do need effective monitoring. We do need to articulate standards of behavior. We do need to have codes of practice that say we, we do respect each other face-to-face -face or online. And bluntly, we need to enforce them. There need to be consequences for staff or students who violate codes of practice of mutual respect. And if, we, if we're not seen to enforce them, we're part of the problem. So I think, I hate to say it, but this challenge will be with us for a long, forever, but it's up to us how we respond to it and how effectively we respond to it. And it just requires 
very serious engagement from senior people in universities and we need to be seen to be active in that space. The contact hours question is a very difficult one. I just think it's the wrong number. We, we broadly, um, we, 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 we think of um, what we used to have as the physical timetable as an envelope and roughly speaking, online delivery of modules fits inside that same envelope. But, but using those time slots differently. We know that a one hour long lecture does not work online. So we don't want people to maintain that volume of um, didactic delivery. What we want is to make sure that they're using the time for interaction with their students. And because as I say, content is easy. Anyone with access to the internet can answer almost any factual question you want to ask them. But learning from each other, interacting with each other is where we develop as people and as scholars. So our focus has not been on contact time in the sense of lectures, but contact in terms of engagement time and how much time you're spending interacting with each other. And that re will remain an emphasis for us. We have a uh, question, sorry. Yeah, I have a few more questions. I'm just reading okay. it. I know there's a lot of people asking questions too. They enjoyed your talk, obviously. One is the <coughs> LMS system, which LMS system, learning management system you are using. And another interesting question is very, I, I thought is quite interesting, which is that if students are taught using laboratory virtual labs, will the employers be happy and feel confidence about them when they go to the practical? Um, I, I'll, tr I'll try and answer those two questions very quickly. Uh, roughly speaking, we use um, Blackboard, Teams, and Zoom um, for the online delivery. Um, in the future, we want to move to Blackboard and Teams, but at the moment we use all three. Um, we worked closely with employers, um, and in particular with the health service, which employs so many of our students, um, to try and build confidence in, in the laboratory classes. We also have offered skill sessions um, after graduation. Um, if, if our graduating students in specific disciplines feel they need to brush up their skills in a specific um, laboratory-based expertise, then we've offered for them to come back in the summer to, to brush up on those skills. Because it is a real issue um, and it's not going to go away. And um, while COVID is here, our, our access to laboratories is limited. The numbers that can go in is limited. So um, we've been trying to respond to it in multiple ways, but it's, it's a real issue. And of course, ironically, it's an issue in the workplace too. And a great deal of modern pharmaceutical type uh, research laboratories are becoming also remote and virtual and new ways of being found to do things. But in the end, there's an irreducible minimum activity that has to be in the room with, the, with those pieces of equipment and those reagents and so on. And um, so, it's, yeah, it's a good question. We, we're doing our best to support our students through that. Thank you, Professor Tom, H, uh, Tom Howard. I think we have more questions, but I think we are running short of time. We just finished our time limit. So I think so I thank you very much for a beautiful presentation and giving us uh, your feedback on how we have dealt with it, with the COVID scenario. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you Dr. all very much. It's good to meet you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farhana. Thanks, Dr. Tom and uh, Dr. Enamul Haq for in-depth presentation and a very good follow-up session. Um, I think these sessions have facilitated our understanding about different aspects of higher education, especially the outcome-based education. So we are just at the end of this program, and I would like to thank our speakers, our guests, and our participants for your time and patience. And your participation made this event successful. Um, I hope to see you in, uh, tomorrow.
at 8 p.m. as in Bangladesh time. And uh, uh, the Zoom link will be available just at 7.30. So dear all, uh, it would be great if you just spend 30 seconds to answer a question regarding this webinar. Thank you, everyone. See you on the next day.